Holy crap, it's like I'm teaching a web class today. How many are on there? Nice to see you all in Webland. I appreciate your commitment to signing in, even if you are not here in this room. We're a little skinny on our attendance in this room. I'm hoping this picks up, but I'm glad you guys are all um, signed in. This will be a great one. Mike Hicks is an excellent uh, person to be in the room with. So, Bill arrived. Awesome. Okay, so we are going to get going. Let's talk about, um, let's screen here just one more time. So let's talk about our leaderboard. How are we doing on getting our numbers tracked? And congratulations this past week. Sheila Mitchell putting the numbers in the database. Maria Stafford making connections. Tammy handwritten notes. Is that you? From last week. Nice job. And Sheila Mitchell on Homes Previewed. Appointments. Maria's killing everybody on appointments from last week. Maria Stafford, she's getting the agreements because she's going on the appointments. Everybody. Everybody in um, internet land, written contracts, Trish. Right? Can I call you Trisha? Do I have to call you Trisha? Trish, I say Trish. Trish. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it says Trish. I'm in trouble. Oh, I don't know. I should say anything. Oh. oh, there we go. Okay, and Maria, close contracts, you guys. Nice job. Trish, Lori, this is what it's all about, right? Is you get close. That's what we want. Jessica. A what? Yes. Yes. Jessica. Oh, that's I'm Maria Spafo. I only had one closed contract, not two. Oh, gotcha. Instead of two. Okay, that you still count. That's awesome. Well done. Nice job. Hey, Jess. Yes. Can you hear us in Pocatello? Hi. Hey, Justin, some of Justin's things that he said he has entered are not showing up. This is just for last week. Okay. Is yeah. that do, what do you, what do you, what I'm say missing, you, Justin? I'm missing a written contract, a signed, two signed agreements. And you put them in your and you put them in your milestones in daily 10 4? I thought so, but go back and check it. Go look right now. Go put them in your mind. We're gonna go, we're gonna go look and see what he says, Justin, and then we'll let you know. Okay, awesome. Appreciate that. Thanks, you guys. Congratulations, Justin. Nice job. Nice job. Okay. So you guys, we're gonna talk a little more today. We are in the last week, the last week of the month. I mean, the last, well, the last week of your month, your four weeks. We are down to scant numbers in this room. I will encourage you guys, this is the week that, that, that keeps the money in the bank. Because you can put the check, you can get the check, but it cashes it this week. This is the week we're keeping the deals together. This is where skill comes into your business, right? Lead gen is a numbers game. Even a blind squirrel can find a nut in lead gen. Come on, guys, it's Monday. They've got to be funny. That's a good one. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Stephen. So, in that idea is numbers game at Lead Gem is, is just doing it and it's a numbers game. Holding your deal together is absolute skill. Thinking outside the box. And of course, Mike Hicks is teaching us together and, and today, and he is a master at this. So, ask your questions. Come up with those ideas and, and get those out there. So, let's talk about how we're doing on missions. Okay, this is our last week, you guys. How many of you guys are skipping missions and haven't got them? Have you got them all done? Kind of, kind of, sort of? You're doing some of them? Watch the videos? How about you guys? How are the missions going? How about you guys in internet land? Is it hard? Lots of homework? Are you finding value, Bill, as you do them? Oh, my word. It is really good. It is really good. So now the reason we're pushing this really hard at this point, you guys, is after you're done, are you feeling like I'm so excited that I don't have to go to Ignite next week? Are you kind of getting excited about that? Why should you be worried if you have those feelings? You shouldn't. Shouldn't you be? Not if you're excited to do lead gen and you do all the right things. There it is, Stephen. And have more time. That's right. So you're saying, well, then what you want to say is, if you're thinking, oh, I'm so excited that I don't have to hurry and get up and get to class, and you should be on Tuesdays and Thursdays doing the exact same thing. You should be spending three hours in the morning getting your business going and doing those things. Are you guys finding everything that's coming up in between? It's easy not to show up in the office at 9 a.m. Some agents are in by 8 because it is hard. And there's a lot of stuff to do outside of going on appointments. And that stuff, that lead gen needs to get done in the morning. So did you does anybody did anybody see the post I put on Facebook today that Morgan Peterson shared? 
go take a look at our, our KWV Side Hope group, our closed group. And I, I shared the post with Morgan. And it's the top eight things that successful people do. And one of them is do your stuff in the morning. Do the hard stuff in the morning. Don't wait and try to fit it in the rest of the day. Get your most important, your 20% done in the morning. So for you guys, that is the key. Getting in here and getting your stuff done every day, you're set on a course for the past four weeks. You're on that course, on the, on the track for a habit. But 66 days is your habit. You've got another month of coming in every day, spending hours every day finding business and getting organized, Tent sending out, doing follow-up, um, learning. That's a big thing that will go out the window too. Not just lead to, but learning, not watching videos, not reading um, materials and learning those things. You need to put those in your calendar. You need to have some kind of education on your calendar every day. If you took 10 minutes and did that now on the text this morning, did everybody get the text on downloading the Maps Coaching app? So the Maps Coaching app, every morning will send you a little push notification to do the power up. And it's day, um, Diana Kukowski giving a two or three minute video, you know, inspirational thing because they want to get you started on that. So I encourage you, keep that habit going. Use that power up every morning as a, I'm going to quick get my mindset correct and I'm going to get it to my lead gen. And I'm going to get in and get that lead gen done and then I'm going to get my follow up done. And I'm going to do a little education every day. Every day I'm going to watch, maybe I'm going to search for a video. Maybe I'm going to do that. Now also scripting. You guys, find a scripting partner. And make a call. If you guys are going to start lead gen each day, find a partner. Say, hey, Tammy, would you be my scripting partner? Can I call you at 9 a.m. and just pretend like you're one of, you're out there, you know, doing it. And then just do it. And then Tammy goes back. And don't chat. And don't say, hi, how are you doing? And, you know, don't waste your time. Script for 10 minutes and get off the phone. And then go right into Legion. Because how many of you guys found that after the first or second call, things start to roll? If I can get past those first or second conversations, things start to pick up and I'm doing pretty well. Would you guys agree? So get your first and second conversation done with Steven. Ring, ring, ring. Pick it up with Steven. I run it through. I fumble it out. Get it all fumbled away. Do it again. He fumbles back with me. I get in the mindset and I start making calls. So get a scripting partner. Find someone who else is trying to do it. We've got 18 people in Ignite. The drawback is, is the structure, right? We hate having that accountability and having to do it every day. But we need it. We need it. Okay? Anybody have any questions on that? I encourage you to find a scripting partner. Get out of your comfort zone. Meet somebody else. Say, let's do it. Okay, and finish your missions. If you didn't get them done, finish them. Get all your missions done. Get all those videos watched. Get all that stuff accomplished. So how are we doing on contacts? How are your databases looking? What are our struggles? What are our successes? Somebody share some success or struggle. I'm having issues getting all the, all the, um, wow, we're echoing that. Okay. Oh. Justin, I'm going to turn on, I'm going to turn on, uh, now try. Turn off, oh, here you go, um, there you go. Um, I'm just having issues getting all the information, like addresses and stuff. It seems like when I'm walking around and doing that stuff, it seems like everybody just wants to get the number. Yeah. And that's fine. It's a long conversation. Nothing, but it's just hard to get all that stuff. And, you feel like you're an FBI agent saying what you're Right. Right. No, that's exactly right. That's that is the truth, Justin. Thank you for sharing that. Because isn't that you feel like you're peppering them with 20 questions. Oh, and by the way, what's this? And what's this? So how do you think we can get past that? Because that's true. Contribution. How do we do it? So tell me more, Stephen. Um <clears throat> if you're talking to someone who may be a, a potential buyer, you know, just say, you know, would it be a value to really or sorry, seller. Would it be a value to you to know what your house is worth in today's market? Mm -hmm. Well, great. Um, what's your address? <clears throat> and that allows you to research it. And then um, you can go into the app and say, hey, I've got a really amazing app available. Uh, would it be a value to you? Would it be worth it to you to know the prices, the listing prices of houses in your neighborhood or even across the country? Uh, what's the best email address I can send a link to you? That way you can get a free download. Mm -hmm. And great. Now, just in case that bounces back uh, for any reason, what's the best cell number that I can text you a link? 
for this app. Mm -hmm. And that way you've got all three. Excellent. So now what else do we need besides that? We want to get their address. So I'd love to send you a value of evaluation, you know, or whatever right. it is. So we got their address. Awesome. Their names. Their, their names. Get their names in there. Great. Awesome. You got their email address because you're going to send them a video or you're going to send them a thing. And then the backup, let me text that to you. Great, awesome. Is it okay if we text? Fantastic. Would your wife like to get that? Can I text her as well? What's her number? Now, what else do we need? What other information do we need? You need their birthday, right? Right, Justin? Because you're 20 questioning them. What, are we, what would we say to get their birthday that would be of value to them? I want to send you a birthday card. I'd love to send you a birthday card. What if you did a drawing for a free Starbucks card for everybody who's in that birthday month? Say, hey, everyone's in their birthday month. I throw them into a drive, um, a drawing. What's your month and day of your birthday? And that way I make sure to get it into the birthday, the birthday drawing. Now I've got their birthday. What else? What else do you need? Yes. Yes. Um, if you plug in their cell phone number into Facebook, usually they have an account there with their birthday on it. Ooh, excellent. Facebook stalking. I like it. Then you can avoid having to ask them. I love it. What else, you guys? What else do we need? What else can we do around Legion? What else do we need? Kids' names? How do we get their kids' names? Facebook. Facebook. Excellent. You probably see their kids' names on Facebook. Excellent idea. Where they work. Maybe they're on Facebook. Maybe it's on LinkedIn. Maybe it's somewhere else. But you'll have to go and do it because, Justin, that isn't as, as fast. But you might say, hey, let's be friends on Facebook, and I'll add you to a private group where we do drawings and I get special coupons from my allied resources. Blah, blah. What's your name on Facebook? And, we'll friend, and I'll friend you and add you to my closed group. Now you have the access to find the kids' names and the birthdays and then those kind of things, right? There we go. Now at the same time, you want to have you want to ask questions that bring them value in that conversation. But guess what? You're going to need to write a script, and you're going to need to memorize that script. And Stephen has obviously had a lot of conversations because you can hear him saying, "Okay, I'm going to try to think of questions to draw them along that way." You guys are going to have to come up with a script for that and figure out what is the information when I look at my database. What's the information I need, and how do I create a script so that when I'm in a conversation, I'm walking through and I do not miss getting them? Because, like Justin said, I'm not 20 questioning them. On this little um, on this little post on the uh, from the the 10 uh, affected habits or 10 things that affected people do on Facebook, one of them said they carry a notebook with them all the time, and they don't ever try to remember anything. They grab a quick notebook out and they write it down. They write it down in a little notebook in their purse that they carry with them so they don't ever forget what they're doing. You could do the exact same thing. You could be writing a little, you could have a little pocket notebook and you write things down so that when you get back to your office, you put that notebook out and you cross it out, you know, as you go. Those are things you've got to be thinking of to get yourself in that way. How can I, how can I make myself more effective? You've got to think about that in that aspect. So look at that, look at those ideas. But thank you, Stephen, I think that's exactly right. We've got to think about how can we get more of our information because nothing is worse than wishing we have the information and having to make a second call just to try to get the information when you had them on the phone okay. You talked to them at some point already, right? But come from contribution. I love that. Appreciate that, Stephen. Okay, how are we doing on the note cards or the Facebook messages? Tammy loves the note cards. I do. She loves it. Right up your alley. Clients I was going after are traditional. Type. I love it. I love it. Well, how about you guys? Are you friending Facebook? Yeah. How's that going? Are you friending everybody or you're forgetting to do it? Forgetting, yeah. So you need to time block that in. I mean, as part of your lead gen activities, that is absolutely a lead gen activity, you guys. That's not outside of your two hours. If you get some calls made, you can block out 30 minutes of going back to everybody from the day before, friending them on Facebook, and then sending them a follow-up email or a follow-up message saying, hey, did you get the text from yesterday on the mobile app? If not, here's a link. Share it to your page. That way all your friends can use it as well. Or a video. How many of you guys have made the, the mobile app video on KW Video? Was it easy, Phil? Pretty easy. Yeah. Get in there, you guys. Write it in your notebook, KW Video. If, if there is one thing you make, it should be that KW video, um, that, that mobile app KW video. 
and you just download the KW video app on your phone and go from there. It's super easy. And there's probably one or two videos. There's probably a Thanksgiving video in there that you can make for free. Great way to post that on social media. Great thing to send is a private message to your friends, your cute little video, right? And I don't think you have to be on video, but if you guys have to get over that, right? You need to get face to face, and sometimes that's the fastest way to do it. If I had a better face, I wouldn't have a video. Okay. Oh, nice. <laughs> you want to see it? Yes. Here it is. Hold on, let me turn it up. Wait, is it on YouTube? Yeah. Oh, you put it on YouTube. Oh, we're putting on. on we're sharing screen. it on the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. All right, here we go. Let's see well, YouTube. You have What's day. your uh? <laughs> what uh, is still baked? Still baked. Still baked. Okay, everybody in Internet Land, we're gonna watch <clears throat> mobile app. We're gonna watch Phil's video that everybody should be making. All right, hold on. Bill, up okay. here. Oh, there you go. Here, nice. looking great. Sharing the la la la, so everybody can see. I should have got out in the sun. I think. Here we go. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, and that's it. That's really that's all you have. Hey. To do. I mean, I narrate it. Let's real estate out. You get the most accurate real estate information that you won't find on any other app. Phil, you're a pro. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing it a hundred times. It's all right. Search for property types with these and see inside your dream home with full screen photos and property details. This app allows us to connect so I can provide you with great service faster. By the way, you can also get that girl who gives you the tour of Kellogg International when you go to office. Just visit our app store today to download the free Keller Williams real estate. She, she's the my name and and you as you were in, and so you can easily stay up to date with any new announcements and listings. That is a great video! What? Five seconds yeah, of FaceTime? Fantastic! Fantastic! <laughs> so, you guys, get on there. I love it. Phil, thanks for leading the charge. Oops, I need to go down here. So that's awesome. So get on there, you guys. These are just little things. You guys are trying to come up with all your own stuff. KW Connect, KW Video. Go get out there and try to look for things. Things are already done for you. So utilize that stuff, but you've got to get purposeful. John Maxwell says that you have to have time for thinking. You need a time block in strategy and thinking time. You've got to sit down and think, I'm going to strategize about new things, what I would want to do for 30 minutes. You know twice a week and you need to sit and think without any distractions I, I found Pandora has a great uh, instrumental station that if I put my noise canceling headphones in and I turn that down a little bit I can't hear anything else and I can sit and think so I'm not distracted by other people it's really hard for me to stay on task so you think of ways to get in there and get that done and make that work so great job Phil I appreciate you sharing that with us yeah. So I'm challenging everybody to get your video done today. And there, you don't have to put a video of yourself on there. You can just do, you know, you can put the, they have the cute little, uh, like the, the Keller Williams at the end. But I encourage you, you've got to get, probably get past it. You can put a little business card with your picture and then your information and your voice behind it. But I would say you need to probably get over the video issue. <laughs> They're going to see you in person at some point. So, just so yeah, you know. Yeah, I just can't afford to replace everybody's cameras when they do. You know? It is, I was in a church, and we were saying something about video, and we were saying something, oh no, we were talking about pictures, and we were doing, no, I don't think it was in church, it was somewhere, and I it was a bunch of, it seemed to like kind of older women, and they all said, oh, you know, I've got a picture, and I'm like, is it in the last three years? Well, I don't really like that picture. I said, honey, get over it. That's what you look like. <laughs> For all these, I said, we all need to get over it. And that's what we look like. They're going to see you. In Family Reunion, there was a lady, bless her heart, a huge producer. Oh, my word. I shouldn't say that in a minute. A huge producer. She's a, she, I mean, a mega, mega agent. And they put her picture up when they announced her name. She was going to be on stage. It was going to be amazing. Beautiful. And then it cut to her live, full stream. It was like a rumor. We thought, holy moly, 
It did not I'm look like her it. in any way. But guess what? We still saw her. And all it looks like is that you're trying to manipulate what people see. We have to just get over it. That's what we look like. You shouldn't have Photoshop pictures that don't look like you. You shouldn't be using pictures from 20 years ago. You know, if you were if you were 30 pounds lighter, guess what? You're not 30 pounds lighter anymore. This is what you look like, right? But I can tell you guys the story of the little Wait, Mexican lady. Are just proof that you would like to That's right. for. I handed this little sweet um, Mexican lady in El Paso, who barely spoke English. Sweetest little lady. She's probably four foot eight. And I handed her my business card, and she looked at it, and she looked at me. She looked at it. She looked at me. Is this you? Yes. Oh, you're probably just wearing more makeup. Okay. Nice <laughs> right picture. It is time for a new picture. And so, and it wasn't that old. It was just a couple years old. But we changed. We looked at that. And, we, and you guys, what you want to do is you want your picture that when they see you in Sam's Club or at the soccer game, they recognize you. We're not here to be secret agents. We're not here to have our names on the billboard and be someone they don't talk to. They're like, I've seen your stuff all over. I've seen your house, your signs, your flyers, your whatever. If they can't tell it was you from your picture or your video, you're not helping yourself. So we just got to get over it. On Facebook, they should know you. They should see you. Okay? So let's talk about tracking in um, our Daily 10 4, you guys. Um, somebody mentioned, text me this morning saying you can't go back. To put last week in there. You got to get this week's in there. And that's the same with your CGI calculator. We're going to move you guys on on Friday for the daily 10-4 into the CGI calculator. And you've got to track it. At the end of the month, you can't go back in. The month is over. So you got to get your numbers in. You've got to put that in your schedule every day to put your numbers and track them in. Put it in. Five minutes. Take it. You remember how many appointments you've gone on the day. But at the end of the week, it's hard to remember how many contacts you made and how many appointments you, you did. So get that done every day. Okay. So, oh, how's previewing homes going? Not bad. Not bad? When you have appointments, it's pretty easy. Right? When you're showing houses, <laughs> yeah. rocks. When you're not showing houses. Because don't I want you guys to be listing agents? I want everyone in this room to be listing agents. So if you have a listing coming up, what if you previewed the homes, the vacant homes in the neighborhood before you went on the listing appointment? How would that go? How, what if you previewed the competition? If you have a listing appointment tomorrow, zip in and zip out. You know, get it done, you guys. That is, it is super important. Super important. You will show there will be so much validity for you if you know your inventory. And I'm learning that there are so many new subdivisions coming up mm -hmm. that just taking a tour and getting to know the streets. So when you take somebody mm -hmm. to a, an appointment, a buyer, or you go to a seller, you're not late for the appointment because you can visit the appointment. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. It's a really point. What a realtor that doesn't know the streets and doesn't know the, you know, the Well, they keep on popping up with new ones every week. So that's true. that's true. You kind of have to. So you guys, I know I normally don't skip our Legion in the morning, but I would really like you to spend as much time with Mike Tapes as possible. So I'm going to encourage you to get your 10 contacts done today and make sure that works. And we're going to get started with Mike. Mr. Mike, come on up and I'm going to show you how this works because normally I show you while they're Legioning and they listen to me instead of calls. So they can just listen this way. I know what you're doing, all of you. You guys, Mr. Hicks, Mike Hicks is our instructor for today. He's been in the business about three years. Sold about two houses last year. Come on, you guys, you're killing me. Uh -huh. That's funny yeah, stuff. Right. Funny stuff. That's right. That's Mike right. is our number one agent in the MLS, has the most units and the most volume in the MLS. He's also part of Gary Keller's Top 100, which means he's in the top 100 agents in the entire company. And he gets to meet regularly with Gary Keller, which is a fantastic thing that uh, is a pretty amazing opportunity um, to hear from him. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Hicks. And you're in. If you have any questions or any problems, you're up. I just think they should try to spread out more. Well, they're used to having people filling the spaces. <laughs> no, you don't have to skinny. strain your neck looking right. at the whole room. The last thing we do when you're done is just put any in here. And just leave it up and I'll come and show you. Okay. Well, you guys are lucky. Buckle up. Strips. It's right up there. So you can see in your in the upper right. There you are. So you can go a little more to the right than you can to the left. Okay. Have a good time. Ask lots of questions, you guys. All right. All right. Good night.
I so few places and I don't recognize So first, thanks for coming in and sharing your time with me. You know, um, real estate and everything we do is a choice, isn't it? And you guys realize that everything we do in real estate is a choice. And one of our big choices, of course, is that we no longer work for anybody, right? We no longer have a boss. How's that? Blessing and a curse. It's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> Why is it a blessing and a curse? You have freedom to do or not do. Yeah. You have a choice. Yeah, usually. Usually. So anyway, it's good. Thanks for coming out and taking your time to be here. So um, what are some of the topics you guys want to be talking about? What were your favorites as far as this class goes? These classes. Let's really hit the stuff. Let's see. The, the CNA class, you know, talking about crunching numbers and, and putting those CMAs together. That I think was really useful. Right there. Good. Good. Okay. I think the biggest thing about this class is that hearing from other agents in the market, big hitters, and hearing them personally. Anybody else? Yeah, from Justin Pocatello. It's the Lord. Hi. Sorry about that. That's freaky, I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, for me, it's the watching the confidence grow in the phone conversations that I'm having. Um, at first, it was pretty, it's still scary. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. But, uh, but yeah, it's getting better. So. Negotiations. What? What are negotiations? What are they? By, by its very idea, when someone says negotiations, negotiate the deal. What do you think of? What's which? What does your gut think we're going to talk about or should talk? Coming to agreement. Coming to agreement. Okay. Good. What else? Give and take. Give and take. No, we can at least agree on it. You mean we shouldn't be given and given? <laughs> what we say. No. Working the deal so that everybody wins or gets a satisfactory outcome. Totally can get a win win. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Good. That's good. Um, are negotiations hard? <clears throat> Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. So, um, I refer to this every now and then. I'm supposed to stay on script. You guys can't find Just finding the right house. Yeah. Showing the homes, right? So, by the way, a mindset thing when you're going out, not saying you're going out to show homes, you're going out to sell homes. Now, you have to understand in real estate, do you really sell property? No. You really sell property? We help them find property that meets their needs. They want to buy it. I walk up to any one of you and try to sell you a two hundred fifty thousand dollars house. How do you feel about me? On the other hand, if I help you identify your wants, needs, and desires and find you a product that fills those wants, needs, and desires, you don't want to buy it, right? You don't want to be sold. Yeah, you don't want to be sold. You really don't. There's some things you can be sold, um, but most often now we don't like to be sold to. We, we like to be worked with. You know, there's no time to sell. So. Um, the seller is interesting. It's just surprised to me, and I think we great speakers in the survey. Six most important things: negotiations for sell. Why would they? Why would they think that? Maybe they don't understand what negotiation is, right? Or when it starts, or, or what it's all about. So, you know, there's a funnel of things, right? 
is we start off with we've got a funnel. We're funneling everything down for purposes of getting what? Because the host contracts to close, right? So we start here. What's up here? List of appointments. Prospects? Yeah. So we have prospects that lead to showings or appointments, right? That hopefully lead to contracts that lead to negotiations that lead to closings that lead to table right so remember all i started off today talking about choices so if you go through understand the key negotiations negotiations all about choices right choices that you're making choices that the other agent's making choices the sellers are making and choices the buyers are making by the way you'll never here we refer to any any folks that I work with as my clients or my buyers or my sellers. Why not? And you hear this all the time in our industry. All the time you hear this. Why would I not refer to this? We were working together and we had your home listing. Home listing. And you were overhearing the conversation that I was having with somebody else. And I said, my sellers, how do you feel about that? Versus the owners of the home, the sellers, versus my sellers. Because when did I get in possession of something? Because when did I, you know, my communicates ownership, doesn't it? What else does it communicate? Cards, my sellers, my buyers. So, you know, in the spirit of cooperation, as we negotiate, this is a subtle little thing, but it's important. We have a conversation with me. We're talking about something, and you say, Well, what do the sellers want to do? And I say, Well, I'm not really sure what they want to do. So, I try to make it simple versus, I'm not sure what my, my sellers are going to do. But, you know, if this, there's the sub, there's subtle key in negotiation. So, make sure that you. Partnership that you have to communicate with. Negotiation is kind of a partnership, isn't it? Even though, even though each each side of the negotiation has their goals, right? In the end, it's the same. Just to change the ownership of the property. Right? In the end, it's the same goal. We want to change the ownership of the property from here to here. So. Um, you know, the other part of it, too, is to make, is to make another agent feel like they're negotiating with you before you know, they're negotiating with whoever it is on the other side of it, right? You know, you can really stand. And, and it expresses how you feel about things. You know, things move from back to head to front of your head based off of the words that are used. And sometimes those words are giving us the subtleties of how we're going to negotiate, right? And that happens, too. So keep that in mind. This is an important little fundamental. This is a small thing, but it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And how do you refer to the buyers? Just as the buyers? The buyers. Okay. And sellers, I, reckon, I rarely recommend, I rarely refer to them as the sellers. I usually refer to them as the owners. That's a different thing, right? It's subtle, but I think it's a value add. Right? Good. Does every owner want to sell? Not right then, necessarily. Well, no, not even, not then necessarily. So, is everything to sell? Maybe. But, you know what? It's still, it communicates something through, through that subtlety. So, I'll refer to it most of the time as the owner. I'll check with the owner to make sure. And it just, you know, it, it just communicates they own the house. It's there. They are selling, <coughs> but, but they're the owner. It's more accurate to speak. So, um, so inside a transaction, who are you negotiating with? Who are you negotiating with, potentially? Where are the potentials? Who? The other agent, okay? Who else? With your own people, with your own clients, right? Which might be buyers or sellers, okay? Or owners, right? Or owners, do that. Who else might you be negotiating with? The other agent. The other agent. Buyers, you got sellers, who else? 
right? Yes, members. Thanks. Treasures. Treasures. Sometimes it isn't that. It doesn't seem like you're working. You're trying to help folks find, help them sometimes find the best financial options to build their future. Um, what about yourself? Why, why would we be part of that? Why are we negotiating with ourselves? Sometimes we need to get out of the way and just let the information pass through as opposed to representing our own interests. So it's potentially with the party. Now, when do negotiations start? When do they start? So let's use some different examples. Your, your, uh, hopefully go to your listing of property. When do negotiations start in that relationship? Do they start at the time you receive an offer, so you have listed it? Do the negotiation when an offer comes in? So when the first the negotiation. negotiation. You, you aren't doing a pricing presentation, you're just presenting yourself. It's a negotiation at that point where you're presenting yourself and you're finding out what their wants are and you're adapting. You're saying, well, I can appreciate you wanting X, Y, Z in, a sum, in the relationship here. And I do provide this and this is how I provide it. And it's, it's a back and forth even at that stage. Start early. Start early. How about, with, how about with the other agent? Let me tell you what happens in my world. So this year, we'll sell 275 listings. 275, 300, and B. So when we have our listings, guess how I receive most offers? Email. So guess how I find out about those offers? That's the point. When I check my email. <laughs> Surprise! There's an offer. <laughs> I think to myself, Shazam! We got a great email. I didn't know it was coming. I don't know anything about the buyers. I don't know anything about the circumstances. I don't know anything about the lender. I don't know anything. All I've got is the email. There's the offer. Now, sometimes I do get a text. And when it's the old timers, what I'll call the old timers, the old timers, <coughs> I will get a phone call. What's the importance of that? Heads up. Be a more ideal time. Be thinking about that. We'll come to that. When, when should it? When is it starting? And when should it start? As far as the offer process. Well, you have to think about what negotiations are too. Now, when when does the negotiation really start? That's what I want you to think. When does the negotiation really start with the other agent, with the owner, with the buyer, with the prospects? When do the negotiations really start? Because that's when you have to be mindful of what you're saying and what you're thinking and what you're trying to do, right? Because you, if you are unaware of when the negotiation is starting, how can you be an effective negotiator? Okay? You have to be thinking about that. When does it start? I said after the showing, uh, where you contact the, the selling agent. And you ask them if there are any other offers on the home, and you're kind of feeling out their position so you know what type of offer you're going to have to approach your buyers with to have them submit. We'll talk about that some more. You start at the very beginning. Do you have any tech? Do you want to do this tech? And you have to negotiate that deal. And then you have to negotiate another deal for the buyer to come in. And then Kind of, it's a constant bridging negotiate to another negotiation until you actually close. I mean, that's a negotiation. Now, how many negotiations are there in the process? I mean, if we sit down and just just talk from, from contract to close, how many negotiations are there? What's the minimum number of negotiations you're going to do? The minimum number. And I'm just talking about just topically, the minimum number that you're going to have. 
there's offer and counter offers. There's any time there's inspections that are asked for, and there's possibility for renegotiation and compliance to make, um, which there could be two or three or more to that. And that's so I don't know, three to three to six plus. Let's see what that means. Negotiations do start early in the process. When contracts close, of course, you have to do that initial negotiation to try and find that place where we do something together. We got that lovely inspection, which actually, in most cases, is more stressful than the actual negotiation. Is that weird? You didn't want to unhand it. People negotiate, or you know, they're buying, they're buying the biggest investment in their life, whether it's a hundred thousand or eighty thousand or half a million or a million. It's it's a big deal at that moment in time. But they seem to negotiate these big numbers with time. We get all shouldn't all over ourselves on two, three, four, five hundred dollars for some care. How weird is that? Right? Kind of a nickel. Inspections are out of control. You feel more control if you're negotiating versus having a home inspection and just sit there and pass it out. What's the difference? It's not. That's what you need to know. Did you see what the seller is going to do if the home is condemned? If you're not negotiating correctly, then I tell you what you said is true. So a large part of negotiation is preparation. What you're talking about, right? The three Ps about negotiation, effective quoting, and sharing the offer. So we'll come to that. Um, so there's an exercise I wanted to have in here. And this is talking about topics for negotiation. And finding a couple topics and just role playing a couple things just to see how this might go. Um, and they can be simple things. So what did I just talk about a minute ago? People negotiate over 100, 200, and they do a big deal. They negotiate the big deal, and then we have the little stuff. And more, more often than not, people want to choke on gnats while they're trying to swallow a horse. Or a silly sea thing. I don't know if that's going to go well. Choke on a gnat, that would be a right joke. Right? Or just this little gnat, it's just this little detail. So there's a word about it when you're writing about it. <laughs> Breathing hard, those words are doing it deep. So, um, so I'm going to give you an example of something. I, and so I want two volunteers to talk about that. Two volunteers. <coughs> oh, you're all in. Okay. okay. I'll go get somebody else. Very good. The reporter, how about you two? You're close to me. Okay. Okay. I'll try you guys out there. You won't be able to see. Oh, you're up there, not down. <laughs> okay, so here's the situation. We're, we're in a negotiation, and in the basement of this house, in the freezer that's been there since 1928, it's an old pumpkin freezer, bigger than most desks, weighs probably about 800 pounds. It's been dead for years, in other words. It's sitting in the basement, the seller doesn't want to move it, and the buyer doesn't want it there when they move it. There's the owner, there's the buyer. How do you settle this? What's the price? There's two agents. You're the agent for the owner, and you're the agent for the buyer. How are you going to work through this? What's the approach? Well, I would do my best. I can't tell you the owner is going to get out of it. When would you start trying to persuade the owner about this? As soon as we do the resolution. Okay. And so, I don't want to leave. I don't want to take it out. I mean, do you understand what it would take to get this out of here? No, I don't. Maybe you should explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> How about 1928? I can't even lift one side of it. Okay. I have no idea what the county is going to charge to get rid of it. 
I'm doing now. What would it cost to get it fixed and leave it? Can you get a sale? Probably a good or something. <laughs> All right. <laughs> What's the buyers think? What are the buyers think? The buyers think? What are they think? They may be able to sell their responsibility on it because they're the owner of the client and not necessarily the client. That's true. So what that other thing you want to do? What else could they think? Uh, I'll give you a hint. The same thing as the owners. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's exactly how the buyers feel. It's a miracle. They feel the same way. I can't even, they can't lift up one side of the other. They can't sell the other. Now, what I would tell you is the negotiation about that freezer, if the first time the owner's hearing about it, that dead freezer that you saw when you walked through the house, you didn't say anything about, when should the negotiation about that freezer have started? Before you listed it, or while you were listed it, right? Where's the negotiations? I don't want to take it out of there. You know what? I get it. Truth is, most buyers are going to feel just like you. Are you willing to not sell your house because of the freezer? If the answer is no, then what you should probably do is help find out how much it's going to cost for you to get rid of it. Now, maybe we'll find a buyer who doesn't care, and you can't even get it. We'll tell you we have to get it. But you need to be prepared for what you're going to do with it. And just in case you can have it come up. Just in case you can have it. So now what's happened when you've done that? Time is listed. What's happened to the owner? You think about it. Time to think about it. You have time to adjust about it. They have time to pick up 911, somebody get rid of this thing, sir. there or not? No. Not the contract. It's not. So what, what's your name in the corner? I'm sorry. Brittany. Brittany. So, so Brittany's buyer has that and gives Brittany the offer and assumes, as does Brittany, that that allowance is going to be there. Until the day of closing, of course, when it's not. Mm -hmm. Not the day of closing when it's not. Things that potentially are issues, the sooner you address them, the sooner the better. On on most contracts, at least in the MLS, it says exclusions, selling certain property. It does. So, and even Mike says that that seems redundant. It does. 
you know, you, you just assume that if it's their property, it's valid. And yeah. so, that's so how I say so where does it's just something when you're going through a house, I'm just telling you this little topic comes up, right? Things like this come up. If they're big and they look like they're dead, there's spare cars, so you're showing Kate's property, there's all kinds of stuff sitting out in the field or parked beside the shop. They got the they got the old car body, they've got the old farm equipment, they've got all this stuff. Do not assume anything. You better be asking. You better be asking. So written in that case, because it's an issue for the buyer, you should be making it clear. I want to make sure we understand that they want the trees are gone. What's the what's the what's the owner's plan for that freezer? That's a communication for the office. What's their plan for it? Okay, we're just going to leave it. Oh, okay, I can let you know when you put it in the office, you want it gone. So, things like that, it's good. Be clear, right? Make sure that that's part of the negotiation, though, isn't it? Negotiation is proof that they are not complete. And so, these little things can turn into landmines later on. You roll your eyes on how did this mountain, how did this little molehill turn into a mountain? What are some of the topics um, for negotiation bargaining? Do you have a take process? Who's going to do the take process? Between <laughs> two or more parties, each with its own aims and each viewpoint, seeking to discover common ground and reach an agreement to settle a matter of mutual concern or resolve a conflict. So I go back to this freezer deal. Um, unfortunately, inside your real estate experience, you're going to have things that come up at the last minute that you didn't anticipate. So I went back and said, start negotiating sooner. Often, we're going to be starting to negotiate at the point in time that you've got a you really bad issue. And you will find a really stressful thing that happens. Um, and it's amazing how in the transaction, Try to be slow to slow to bring down as you can as soon as you can. Um, so this this video we'll see if we can do it all the time. You know I'm seven How hard is that? Keep your opinions and emotions out of it. Just facilitate a successful transaction for your client. Why is it difficult to keep your emotions and opinions out of it? Because you're kind of vested in the transaction. Why? Are you vested? In, in theory, you are. Because in order for you to get a paycheck, it has to close. Now, if you're doing lead gen and filling the pipeline every single day, you're less attached to that specific contract. Could it make any difference how much is in the pipeline? Really, no. Absolutely not. Not even really. It shouldn't be. Being attached to the outcome changes everything. I think it goes back to what you're talking about with sort of investing in the client. Like you refer to them as your seller or your buyer. Um, that's going to be separate. Possessing them and everything that, that goes into the transaction is sort of personal to you, then. That should be. You can't truly negotiate with anything that you don't have any emotions. You can't see it. <laughs> so think about politics. 
So we, we had a Remax franchise here for years before the only thing with Remax franchise was the same kind of work. Um, and so we, my partner, decided to build these cars. And we came and met the vendor. And he said, oh my, hey, Jamie, why do you want to do that? Said, you got a 50 50 chance of being right. 50 50 chance of being wrong. No matter what you do, somebody, somebody's upset at you. So, what does that have to do with real estate? Why would I tell you that story? Why would I say anything about that? Everybody wanted to be that <laughs> You know, the reason that I bring that up, honestly, is as hard as it, is, as it is for you to sit in somebody's living room in their dining room and spend time with them and ride around in the car with them and do all the stuff and get all chummy and talk and wow you. But you know what? They can make decisions that you don't agree with. They will have opinions that you don't share the same opinion. Can you believe that? I mean, you have to all have been hired as their consultant, right? Why wouldn't they take your advice? Why would they disagree with you? Why would they make you go off and do stuff with them that you personally would not do? True? Mm -hmm. Gosh, they make decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. And the minute that they do that and you go, what are you doing? You're passing judgment. You're out of curiosity, you're into judgment, and you're attached to the outcome. And you don't like the decision you're making. Right? That's not our job. So stay in curiosity, stay out of judgment as best we can during negotiations. Um, I don't know if I'm going to find this video or not. I know it popped right up on her own. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Henry. Anderson is one of the Zoom videos. He, he talked about the very first rule of negotiation is staying in curiosity. Um, I think that's happening. I said, I can't it. Um, Let's see if this is supposed to share the screen. This works. There you go. There you go. You're good. Okay. I'm Josh Anderson from Nashville, Tennessee. I've been with Keller Williams since 2006. In um, 2014, we did about 200 transactions for about $60 million in volume. I grew up on a farm, so I've always seen my dad negotiating land and cows and horses, being the youngest of four, and I'm trading and negotiating. All growing up, so I've kind of done it all the time. But some people are certainly gravitating toward it and are naturally better at it than others. But I think that negotiation can definitely be learned. I think there's a lot of skills that go into um, being a great negotiator. I think it's learning your client. Instead of kind of assuming that you know what's important to them, really asking a lot of questions and letting them tell you what they need or want, and then speaking to the other agent and finding out what's most important to their client. And there's some agents that just don't get any. When I have an agent that I'm dealing with, it's very tight lipped. I just keep asking questions, and they give me information that they might not have otherwise given. What? Most important to their client. And there's some agents that just don't give any. 
When I have an agent that I'm dealing with, your client. Instead of kind of assuming that you know what's important to them, really asking a lot of questions and letting them tell you what they need or want, and then speaking to the other agent and finding out what's most important to their client. What, what did you just say? Find out from the other agent what's important to the other side. And when did that call happen? When, when does that call happen? Early on, when you know that you're going to likely submit an offer, call and feel out the situation with the other agent. So when might that be? After the showing, or after you're showing that you're expressing interest in before the offer, or before you go for your second look, or your first second look, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So why, why again? What's, why are you doing that? Do you care what's important? You're, you're representing the buyer. Do you care what's important to the owner? Why? Huh? Yeah, why? I'm just, not saying you're right or wrong, but saying why. So don't let my toe put you out of the defense, okay? Your negotiations need to come up with a win for the seller and a win for the buyer. If you don't know what the seller wants, how do you do that? And if you happen to be able to write an offer that accommodates the needs of the seller, what happens? What's in it for the buyer? Right. I'm asking you a question. What's in it for the buyer? A successful transaction. A successful transaction. Might they get something else? What's negotiation? What What do we say negotiation is? Give and take. Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is important. If you know what the owner needs, or what the high points or the important things are. So let's just say, as you go through the house, the buyers love in the house, and they walk in, and there's a ten thousand dollar set of washers and dryers sitting there. I mean, this thing, this, I mean, it's just the most amazing. And the buyers say, "Ooh, if we offer on this house, we want the washing machine and dryer." And you're thinking to yourself, "There's no way they're going to get that brand new beautiful set. I mean, that's got to be the most beautiful washer dryer I've ever seen." <laughs> I'm in judgment, right? I'm judging what somebody I've never spoken with or had a discussion with how they feel about something. And I'm about to say it out loud to shut the buyer's dreams down. Rather than ask lots of questions. So now we're going to go back for a second look. And I say, well, Phil. We're headed back for a second look, buyer kind of like the place. We're going to see a couple other properties for a second time as well. They really thought the washer and dryer were pretty cool. We're noticing the MLS that they're not included. Are the owners attached to those? That's a good question. That's a good question. I'll have to ask the owners and find out. I'll let you know. Rather than as an agent for the for the owners. The seller saying, well, there's that's a good like ten thousand dollar washer and dryer. There's no way they'll leave that. So let's keep it out. They probably haven't talked to the owner either. Maybe a little bit. But now maybe times have changed since the time you sat down and had that discussion. Stay in curiosity. Ask questions. Ask lots of questions. And remember what I'm telling you guys is don't just secretly, don't be a secret agent and secret write up an offer and in the stealth of the night email it to the other agents so first thing in the morning they see that offer and they've never heard word from you never had any idea that it was coming don't do that you are not helping the negotiation if you're a stealth negotiator it doesn't work despite all popular opinions out there it is not effective before you send a counter offer call them and say we're sending you a counter offer Here's what it's about, and this is why the buyers did what they did. This is what the owners were thinking, this is why they did what they did. Okay? Negotiations is about communication, not email, not text message, about communication. By the way, text message is really good if you want to have a record of what you did talk about. So don't, I'm not completely discount it. And there's some agents that just don't give any. When I have an agent that I'm dealing with that's very tight lipped, I just keep asking questions and they give me information that they might not have otherwise given, whether it's a, a divorce or a death or it's just 
they got relocated to some other city. And I think if you're really listening and being intentional and purposeful about listening, you'll find out exactly what's important to them or what they have to do. And in certain situations, you have to be creative. We're always looking for that next little tip to help our clients out and win the deals. One of the techniques that we've used a lot that's worked well for us is the escalation clause. For example, if the property is listed at two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, we might go in at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars with strong terms and and special stipulations. We might put in there that we're willing to beat the next best documented offer by a thousand dollars up to two hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars, and the best offer might be two hundred sixty-one thousand dollars. So we end up getting it for two hundred sixty-two thousand dollars. From a client standpoint, be willing to have a real conversation. It's not us just being realtors for them. It's us consulting and advising and really telling them, if you really want this property, here's what you have to do to get it. Everybody's got a different way of how they would negotiate. And networking with other fellow agents around the country, the more you hear it, the more ideas you and then you end up gearing it towards you and what you think is going to work best for you and clients. A lot of it comes down to experience, and um, I think the more deals you do, the more comfortable you get with it. If you can step back from every transaction and learn something, you're going to get really good every time. What do you think? What are the highlights? I like the state which says be creative, don't be afraid to use new tactics. I think that's just saying be creative, be aware that there's lots of moving parts that can be located, not just price. Yes. So let me ask you, we have um, multiple offers coming. Why? How does that conversation help your buyer in a multiple in a multiple offers? That early conversation with the other agent. Guys, I'm trying to find a stop share up there. You know, I don't seem to find much for you. So I have to be more than what's on the screen. So, the escalation caused the idea of that is that when you make an offer, there's not multiple offers, right? So, you call the agent and say, Hey, any offers? Nope. Okay, great, thanks. You write your offer, you should tell the clients, hey, no, no other offers. So this created an offer that's designed to negotiate, which means what? They're negotiating, right? They're not asking, they're not going to offer the owner what they want for the house. So now they come in and they make an offer that's a little bit lower. Then a second offer comes in. The agent advises, change the offer. Now, it could be that you've done this in the very beginning because you knew there were other offers, or now you're doing it because there is another offer came in while yours was on the table. Right? So keep in mind the second offer, if that agent was on the phone and called and said, Hey Mike, are there any offers on that? Yes, we've got an offer. Okay, I'll advise my clients. And when that offer comes in, that offer has been influenced by the fact there's another offer, right? Theoretically. That's the highest and best coming from the second buyer. Has the first buyer had the same courtesy? No. So second buyer comes back right away. First buyer comes back right away and says, okay, here's some additional documents. So when we did this in the very beginning of the other end, sit down and say, so how much do you guys want this house? We want real bad. We really want this house. How much do you want? Are you willing to pay full price? Yes, 
yes or not. Are you willing to pay $5,000 more than what's listed for? No, we're not. Okay, so how much do you want? You want a full price? You want it to be your client? How much do they want? And so there, when, that's where Josh said up to 262, he said it was listed for 250. And they said that they would pay up to a thousand dollars more than any other offer received by the owner up to a maximum of 263. So they created a lid. So now that that other agent and the owner, the seller, now knows that they have got an offer that's good up to 263. Now the other part of the language also says that they've got to produce a copy of the other agreement at that 264. So you can't just say 263 automatic, right? What's to stop them from saying 263? In fact, they've got some papers showing that the other buyer was willing to pay 264. So that's how it works. We've got some specific language in the building for that. So if you've never done it before, well, I'm sure you can get the specific language of one of us has done. That's the idea. So the buyer is willing to pay more than what's listed for it. They get the straight of the deal, or they're, I mean, the odds of them finding another house like it is low. Right? Now, what's the rest of the discussion you can have with a buyer in a situation like that, or a seller? This is pre negotiation stuff. Is there going to be an appraisal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this not a cash offer, and it involves financing, and it involves an appraisal. And it doesn't appraise the selling price, then what? Maybe. Probably. Something's happening, right? What would keep the listing agent from just countering at the upper end of that escalation loss? Sorry. Right. Um, there's a there in the background, guys. So now we can close the door. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're fine. That's Natalie. <laughs> yeah, Natalie's here. <laughs> so, what would keep the listing agent from sending back a counter towards the upper end of that escalation clause and keeping on the hook with the negotiation? Because your offer is too big. They've got to have another offer written. That but if they don't accept that offer and simply counter at a higher price, no, they have to. No, you're not. The way it's written, it's a higher price. You can't just be throwing a higher number. I see. And they have to provide a copy of it. You know? Okay. So that's a close to $8.56. It's $258. You have your kit max only is $263. So you could say, okay, $259. Right. So we'll say that the seller went out in this situation and said, hey, I've got three offers, highest and best. So your offer from your client is $250 with the escalation clause. There's another offer for $261 and one for $259. They don't have the escalation clause. Now what happens is the seller, could go back and counter all the offers again. You could go to the 261 and counter and forget about the escalation. Or say, huh, everybody's made their highest and their best. That was the definition of it to begin with, right? Everybody's made their highest and best. One of my highest and best is that I'll pay a thousand dollars more than the highest offer as long as it doesn't go over 263. So now I send you the counter offer or the document I've got that says this buyer over here, your buyer was willing to pay 261. Yours is willing to pay a thousand more. We're going to sign your offer at 262,000 and show you, show her that your buyer offered 261. Okay. So that's what that's how it works. Interesting. Very interesting. What else did you get out of this video? Anything? The uh, being curious between that. Listening and in purpose mode. What does that mean? It's understanding what we are listening for, what their motives to sell or what their motives to buy are. And so when you go in and when you go in the negotiation to use that to get the best deal for the client. Are we always going for the best deal? Are we going for the best deal? What's, what's our objective of negotiation? 
which may or may not be outcomes. Last night I was watching Shark Tank. Oh. Well, one of the offers, one of the sharks was offering their deal was a higher percentage of ownership of the company that they were going to finance or invest in versus another one of the sharks. And the person with the product took the offer that gave up the higher percentage of ownership. Because that person felt more on par, more on the same wavelength as with that shark versus, so it felt like that shark would be more committed to the transaction. So that was the best deal. Was it the best deal? It was the best fit. So wouldn't that, I, and I'm just being, right. I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do, but wouldn't that be the best deal if they took that? Because there was more than just the money and the ownership of business. Shared in the long run, in, their, in the shared vision, right? But at that moment in time, not the best deal. It wasn't the best financial deal at that time. I believe perhaps over the long term, or maybe it wasn't about the money, it was just I just felt better about the way being a business with this other person. And so it can be that way, but you know, when it comes into multiple offers, um, I've seen sellers take less money from buyers that they wanted to have it because something in the process was, was communicated about the buyer. And the owners take them less because they like to fit, they care about who bought their house. Some don't care. You don't know. That's, that's why we stay out of judgment. And stay so, that one of the questions you ask then the owner uh, is this do you care who buys your home? And if it's investing, I don't think we. You might, find, you might find out later on, so I can take this question. Okay. But that's not going to be the question. Usually not. It could be. Um, I want to know why they're doing what they're doing as much as possible. Um, and we'll just double check and make sure and ask the question. Sure. Which one do you have these other choices? So, so the goal of a negotiation is to arrive at an agreement, right? And is to try to arrive at agreement. Now, a transaction where there is a winner and a loser, I'll tell you if it feels like there is a win and a lose in the negotiation. My experience is that you're in for a rough ride getting to the end of the transaction. Because the winner wants to keep winning and the loser is tired of losing. It's a mindset. That people get into. You can help fix my speed. <laughs> they come at the right time. You are completely perfect. These poor guys are doing good. Now it's on the screen. Do you recommend, and I've heard the term love letters, but do you recommend a buyer writing a letter to an owner saying, you know what, this is why we love your house. I grew up with a wood burning stove and you guys have one. It's the perfect yard for our kids. And do you recommend that? It's a great thing. I've never seen it go wrong. Never seen it go the other way. I could stand them on my house. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, but it works. Now on the on the buyer side, if you send that, does that ticket at the end? Does that say I mean, so the seller sees a letter like that and they think, well, we should negotiate this higher because they do have this house. Most of the time when we have that type of letter, it's in it's in a competitive situation, but we're anticipating it. So we not, but I you know, in the end, most owners do care. If it's an owner occupied property, maybe there should be a free period of time. And if there's some attachment, it be wise. It really is. Usually. And so it usually doesn't cause them to negotiate harder. I, I hear what you're saying. In the end, buyers are always going to be willing to do what they want. Inside a negotiation, remember I talked to you earlier, the people 
they like the paper deal. They made the big dollars. We negotiate for the 150, 200, whatever the number is. And then we get hung up in the details, right? <clears throat> How do you get people past those details? What is, what is one thing that you remember? Heard in the video, the very first thing you said in the video was what? To do what? To do curiosity, ask questions. Ask a lot of questions. So why why did I just go back to that? You're asking questions and remind people of their motivation to begin with. Sometimes we have to help people get back to this. They are when folks get hung up on the principle of the thing, we've got challenges. <laughs> Best. Best. Bye -bye. So you guys are really patient. <laughs> You're really patient. You got all the audio. Well, we didn't. We didn't want to make you feel silly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bashful about this. I do this only when asked. So, and we appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, you know, back to the point. You, you don't want to reveal too much, but it's still important to. When, when we're talking to folks, make sure that they understand why you're buying, what points of interest you have. And so that discussion I talked about where you may be finding out what the priorities are, what the important things are for an owner, it's okay to communicate what might be important to the buyer if you're trying to offer those. So these are the things that are really pretty important to buy. Okay. That, that tractor that you've got out there for that 10 acres. That was pretty important that we qualified that tractor. Do we have a tractor in those things? Yeah. What are the topics? We'll see if we have time to talk about it. So again, try not to get attached to the outcome. So what are some of the areas that we get stuck up, stuck with or that we worked on inside the negotiation? What are, what are the big areas? Think about a purchase. What are the big areas? What's the first big one? Price. Price. Okay. What's another big contingency? What do you mean? The buyer has to sell. The buyers have to call and sell. Okay. So you're not talking about finance. Financing is a well, contingency. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> oh, financing is a big contingency. So what do you have to find out about finance? And who with? So if any of you write an offer on my listing, one of our listings, thank you. First question you'll get. Great. Looking forward to having the offer. Who's the lender? We have a letter. Well, you don't, you please get one right away. And then, and then what happens after I get that letter? I call the lender. Can you believe it? I actually called the lender. Oh my great day. <laughs> you know how many lender letters have been written on a phone call and no credit report run, no taxes, they haven't got anything. Based on what Sam told me, he should be good. No application, no nothing. No, 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 just a five minute phone call. He should be good. Really? Yeah, he sounded really honest. Great. <laughs> so you say I want the pre approval? They don't give pre approval letters anymore. Oh, no. They don't do pre-approvals. I got them a lot of pitch, so they're all through qualifications. But what you can find out when you look at that pre-qualification letter, I got one the other day that was a pre-qualification letter. There were 11 exceptions. 11 of them. Guess, guess how much weight I gave that letter? Kind of a featherweight. Kind of a featherweight. What gave me that? It was from a lender in Arizona. So guess what happened in our counter offer? Buyer has 24 business hours to go to a local lender. <laughs> no kidding. I was in the offer. So you can you can I called I called the lender down there and I got no warm presence. I had no confidence. <laughs> Which by the way, you know, if you're working with a buyer and you've got competing offers, you think having a good loan officer and a good lender is known in this market and carries weight. Versus XYZ lender in Phoenix, Arizona, Washington, D.C., Florida, Chicago. Haven't known when you're working with a buyer, you never know when you're going to get that competitive situation. Try to have it going with a local lender with a known product. 
So what are some of the other things that we offer? What are some of the other areas we get to Closing date, moving date. Closing date, moving. Oh, what's the difference between closing date and closing moving date? Closing date doesn't mean it's all done. You got to make sure that it's done before they move in because otherwise you're going to have a hard time. So, who decides that part? And what's the difference between closing date and moving date? Aren't they the same? Why not? Because the legal process might be done, but everything has to be recorded and everything has to be finished before you really have occupancy available. We're working on it. You go. The seller needs a couple more weeks to be ready to use that. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Hold on for a year. It's important to know that closing date and occupancy are different, and the purchase agreement shows it different because it talks about your closing date, occupancy as of the day of closing, as of some other date, as of earlier date. So um, we have repairs, right? Yes. That comes up. Um, There's commissions and commissions and fees and all that stuff. So there's, we talked about some things, I've been getting ahead without really saying some of the things. So in the negotiation process, what's the first part? What's the first thing, so we're calling this the three P's. The first div is it starts with P. <laughs> so what did we start off saying about negotiations? At the very beginning, we have to prepare. Get to know the other side. Just prepare. Yeah. Just get prepared, right? So, then what? Present. What is that? Present. What is that? That would be communicating with your client and also communicating with the other agent in presenting what the possibilities and recommendations are and presenting the desires of your client to the other agent. Yeah. Um, position is a class one. What's that? What's that? Did you understand? And position is it? So keep you in mind, do you, you always know when you're going to have a complete offer? Does an agent automatically have to tell you when there's another offer? Whose decision is it in the process uh, whether there is a when there's a multiple offer that that the agents are going to know that there's multiple offers? Whose decision is it? Now, in our you know our strategies for this change from what they were at one time, what they are now, and they won't stay in the same thing they are now. So our school of thought, not very long ago, as in just two or three years ago, a couple years ago, was that he called me and said, hey, do you have another offer on that house? And I said, yes, we do. But the buyer usually had more than one house that they liked, and that alone would cause the buyer to offer on the other house and not one to have this. So, so, by, so by making that disclosure, there was a, at least a 50-50 chance yeah. that the buyer would move on to plan B and you'd never get that offer. So today, had a lot of multiple offers, right? <coughs> right. <coughs> Are we getting as many as we were? Multiple offers? Maybe not as much, but still like it, depending on the price you're paying. So, you know, our, our MLS does a few staff meetings. Um, I can tell you from the standpoint of our group that the answer is no, there aren't as many. Finding ourselves in through a multiple offer situation that we're moving into, and we have fewer of them on the property. 
now it's going to be significant. So, um, but in the end, it's the owner's decision about who you know or not. So, what do you do when you get that tax cut from the other agent? Hey, I got folks interested in that house over on 12th Street. Got any offers? permission to talk to the owner about this. However, can I go? Do I already know have that conversation with the owner every night? What do you do? How would you play right now? Are you going to do it in the end? I think I'm 100% sure of this, but I have to know what's happening. Sometimes you don't answer questions by saying, hey, we're going to have to catch you. So, when you're working with buyers, I saw, I think um, we, we spend a lot of time taking buyers, looking at this pool of homes, and we try to get them down to just one. Right? Is that what you do? You try to get them down to just one? How many of you guys have, how many of you guys have shown homes? So, I will tell you that if you can, if possible, number one and number two. It's kind of hard to start that over. Starting all over. And you've been an active part of taking out the house that you perfectly good. Right? And you have actively engaged in discussions and say, oh no, that would never work for me. This house would really work for me. Not on this, one. So this one really doesn't work for me. This is the house. But it would have been a great plan B. Actually, a great house. Was this one better? Yeah, it was better. Would this have been good? Yeah, it would have been good. But you would actively help discharge the house hoping to get them focused on work. And that would try to help them make a decision. You rejected a perfectly good option to help them reject. So be careful about doing that. Okay? I believe them with options. Is that to their advantage to have options? Mm -hmm. Fine. Why is it to their advantage to feel like they have options? The choice is still theirs, the ball is still in their court, regardless of what happens. It can help them not make a decision that they don't want to make, like pay too much money for a house, right? Or the Right. So, it just, None of us likes to feel like a corner. We have no choice, right? So you're, you're always helping people to be able to keep going like this. Choice is not too many. It's good to make up choices. Um, and so you have to, within negotiations, you have to set expectations. So what would be an example of setting an expectation? Yeah. Um, page 16, you guys have page 16. Someone read this. Read this scenario. You are representing a single buyer. The client is renting the present property. Like any first time buyer, she is looking to you to buy her home process. The asking price for the home she really loves is one hundred seventy five thousand dollars. The house appears to evidence a roof leak that is listed as is and is correct in price. Your client would like to keep her payments as low as possible since she has a number of student loans to pay off. She wants to write an offer for one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. There's been quite a bit of activity in the listing. Okay. I'm trying to 
questions would be what could be asked. Yeah, it's is bliss, guys. I never ask him, so that you'll know, I have never in 29 years asked a client how much they would take or how much they would pay. Because they don't know. Until they're right in it, they don't know. And there's no need to be planting the seed either. Well, I said this is the most I'd pay, so I guess that's all I can do. You know, people do that. Just because they said that, now you help them build pockets. So, that's, I appreciate you bringing that up because that helps us all learn as we really think that. So you would think we want to know that. So, um, but what do you want to know? We know one thing. Why is she yeah. offering 155? Because there's a roof. No, she has, has other other debt. Has other debt. And does it say that because it has a roof leak, that's what she's going to offer 155? It doesn't say that. Oh, so then what are we doing? So, we're assuming. We know yet. So, so we will ask her, are you concerned about this as it is? So so what do we want to know? Why are so you know it's, why do you want to offer 155? Right? Why are you offering 155? Okay, that's a great question to know. Do you do you think your student debt has anything to do with the value of this home? Does it? No. I think the seller wants to pay for your education. I say the dark six. I'm a little older than you guys. I can get away with a lot of stuff. So you probably wouldn't want to say that exactly. But you might want to ask questions. So do you think your student loan impacts the value of this home? Do you think that this is all this home is worth in the market? Or is it just it's all it's worth to you? You know, that's okay. How much do you want this home? I have to say, I mean, in, in our head, when you read this, 175 wanted 155, what are you saying? What's your, what's your self talking? I thought she's a little wrong. Yeah. Are you prepared to be rejected? How's it affecting your attitude towards the offer? What do you know about your client's motivations and interests? So if you wouldn't that have you represent your buyer, yeah. wouldn't that have been one of the first like, questions you would want to ask about the price ranges? Why would you show people how to buy It would appear we're finding this out a little late in the process, but mm -hmm. we've been showing these houses and they're gonna have been here. So we, the point, my point here is we want to be asking questions. What is what how did you come up with 155? Why? What is what is it all about? Um, and and also just to say, okay, so how will you feel when the seller counters? I can say yeah. <clears throat> how do you feel when when the owner counters? Because you should be prepared for it. Would you like to know, Ricky, would you like to know my opinion of value on this home? Not a show. You know, you need to be careful about telling people stuff which you're showing them. So, um, now, what's important besides this part of it? What else? I mean, why is she offering on this house anyway? Why is this buyer offering on this house anyway? You want to find out. Her why on that house? What is it about this house of all the ones I've shown you that has drawn you to this? Oh, you, you, you actually want to find out that she really liked it. 
investors usually don't, you know, investors are different. It's a financial decision. But for somebody who's going to move into a house, there's usually some level of emotional attachment. So what did I say back here a minute ago? I'm going to talk to you. Talk to you. Why you bring, always make sure that if you ask questions, if you do, we bring people back to the why, right? Why are you doing this? We need to bring them back to us. They don't get hung up on other on other things that are important. So what's another thing to know in this situation about this buyer? If they're going to offer 155. Is that her bid? That's what you're getting, right? Is that really her bid? Because I have to be honest with you, you know, if 155 is your bid, that's awesome. If the average list to sell ratio in our market, and I'm sorry, I didn't tell you this three weeks ago when we started working, the average list to sell ratio in your price range is 99.4%. Houses in the price range you're looking at on average sell for 99.4% of the list. So on average, it's 175000 House is selling for 73 high, 74. But it's selling more. I'm not telling you that I think that's necessarily what it's worth. I'm just saying, odds are the moment I'm going to have to In fact, let's just take a look at the MLS. Let's just take a look at all the homes we've sold in the past couple of months in the 775 range and see what the biggest discounts have been. It's showing you. Right? Got to build your bank. Now, it would be much better to have done that a while ago because you're educating people about the market, right? Because that's part of what's that? The very first P is what? Preparation. Preparation. When did we start to prepare? Hi, Phil. <laughs> I <like this. laughs> that's when we started to prepare for making the offer. The first time we met. That's when we start preparing for the offer. So as you learn about real estate and go through these things, remember you're preparing from the, from the get-go. So those are some good questions. Um, so we do want to know what our motivations are, right? Could you also ask in part of the preparation setup, uh, ask the listing agent about the seller's situation and why that price with the roof problem? I mean, it says that it was listed price right, but if you were to ask questions and assert a little bit of pressure through those questions, you might be able to get them into a mindset of accepting a lower offer as well. So, how do you, let, let's talk about the discussion with the other agent. Um, so, how many questions is besides that, that you were going through? What are the questions? I'm the listing agent on this. Um, in this scenario, you guys out there can ask questions to you. Um, so, what are the questions you could ask me as the listing agent? Why, why are your owners upset? Do you want to put me on the defensive? Is that what you want to do? No, I don't want to, but I want to see the reaction. Okay. I would ask that question differently. I would say, I notice you listen to the the house is listed as is. I noticed some evidence of a leaky roof. What did your sellers, or what did the sellers do to the Okay. Go on. Just ask questions. Come on. Bring them. What, what questions are you going to ask? These are good questions, and there's different approaches. And you'll, you'll, you'll assume the way you ask your questions is going to, the tenor of that is going to carry through your negotiation, right? So here's what I'm going to tell you. Think about when you were, most of you are of the age of my kids. If you put kids on the defensive with your questions, what do you get? Little or nothing. When did we learn that as kids, right? If, if somebody puts you on the defensive, what do you do? Do you cower or do you come out of the corner? Most of us break aggressive, right? We break out defensive and aggressive for them. So we always want to keep, we have to keep that in mind. We're establishing, as we do this in the first time, we're establishing the tenor of the negotiation. So with that in mind, how do we want to find out about this roof? What do we want to know? What do we want to know about the roof? So thinking about, I mean, what do you want to know about the roof? Does anybody want to know how much it costs? 
Yeah. Possibly. What if it's eighteen thousand dollars? <laughs> then Robert doesn't sound too bad. If that's the case, they know it. Right? But they've earned it, right? So what else you get? So I've given you a hint. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what other questions? What do you want to know about the roof? You want to know what's wrong with it? Mm -hmm. I probably asked if they had like roof inspection or inspection out there. So who did? Right. Yeah, who did it? It's twenty five hundred dollars still. That's all it's going to cost to replace that roof. <laughs> what do you want to know now, Phil? What do you want to know now? Ask who it was and contact the contractor, whatever that saw. How many did they get? Who was it? What was wrong with the roof? Is there any damage? So tell me, Phil, if the roof is eighteen thousand dollars to replace and the buyers pay one hundred seventy-five thousand for the house, do you think it'll be worth one hundred ninety-three when it's all done and said? Because that's what the buyers are thinking, right? Most buyers are usually cash strapped anyway, so they want to move it to closing. They very well could be. They very well could be. So you know, this is the same curiosity. I mean, if you were buying something, what do you want to know? Why are you any different than them? If you are in the saddle with your client, you have all the same curiosities. In fact, you better have more. Has anybody been in the attic to see if there's a dead is the roof leaking? Well, not that you know. Oh, has anybody been in the attic? To look at it? Well, no. Oh, okay. Thanks for letting us know that. Who all did you get this from? Do you have copies of this? Can you send them to me, please? So we're good. What are you doing? We're gathering information, right? We're not we're not trying to put somebody out of the defensive, but we're getting information because this is a big deal, right? It's potentially a big deal. Um, so you know, get in curiosity about this thing, this kind of situation. And just make sure that you you're finding out the same thing. Just like the crew buying it, if you want to slow everything down and make sure you're asking all the questions. Um, so how do you give an offer its best chance? How do you give an offer its best chance? as much as possible to the owners as you can without giving away this, your, your situation for your buyers or your other buyers. Who's the decision maker on what the other guys think of another one? Your guys. Your guys. I think there's times when we will pass on information that we get. It would make a difference whether our clients get home. So it, it's okay to look at your clients and say, is that something you like the owner? Is that something you like the buyer? You know? You know, I really like them. You know that. Because you know if they're sitting there, you know, if it is not in the best interest, then you might want to counsel them and say, well, I'm not sure. So you call. So now we're going to stay with this scenario. And so sure enough, your buyer offered the hundred people. And after all this discussion, she knows the house is worth more money, but she's still going to offer 155 and she just wants to see, you know, and we'll do. She wants to lay down. And you know this information. And you call the other agent. And the other agent, as you're telling them, well, the offer's coming to you, but it's 155 She's going through such and such later. Whoa, 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 whoa. On the other end, yeah. How much is that offer? Is that a good thing laughing? So, it's um, 155. <laughs> <laughs> it's 155. Yeah, so, so I'm the other agent. 
too weak. So we have to introduce unmanned math. So wow, Matt, that's less than we were expecting to see on this house. You tell me, give me any information at all because I need to present this to the owner. And you know, whatever you can tell me to help the owner from just kind of saying no would be helpful. So I've already had this conversation with her, so I would say she has some concerns about the roof, and this is where she needs to be. Okay. Say any more than that? But it don't matter. Back to the market analysis on this. So, you know, the truth is, the value of this is pretty solid. It's not a very tiny. And so when we list it, you know, at least we felt like we were discounting houses. By the way, we got, we got bids. On the roof in a range of between 13 and 16,000. So, I'll send those over to you okay. so that you've got those. Um, and I'll send you my comps so I can show you what we were using to come up with the high cost roof. I really have no idea how the owners are going to act here. Um, I, do, I am sure that they are going to see off the roof. So, if they didn't come over, we'll see what they say. They say. You handled that very well. Was I was I bothered by the offer? Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't. You know, <laughs> you know, I communicated. You did. You know, when I called the owner, here's the next conversation. Phil, it's Mike. How you doing, man? Good, how are you? Doing awesome. Hey, Phil, we got an offer on your house. Great. Hey. Oh, cool. Send it on over. Okay, well, we'll send it to you. So, Phil, I want to let you know it's an offer we're going to need to negotiate. It's not one we're going to accept right away. But you know what? It's an offer. You can take a look at it. The buyer is clearly very concerned about the roof. So that's it, of course, for us usually go to the offer on the house. And this is what the other agents told me. I don't know if there's other factors involved. Um, my guess is your guess is going to be just to say no. But you know what? Just make good. We can once and walk away. So just take a look at it, do the best we can, and, and deal with it. Okay? So she is a good buyer. She has been for a really good lender. All those things are positive. I'm going to send it to you. And after you get done settling down, after you look at the first number, then you call and we'll talk about it. Okay? Thank you. Okay. See you later. She had an Now, then he tells his wife, and you get a phone call from his wife going, What? Are you crazy? Uh, I didn't pass judgment. I didn't say she did. He said, Never accept the offer. In fact, what did I say? So this will be a You might actually turn down. So I'm trying to keep it from turning it down to make sure it's the other person who wants it. Right? You're not going to accept this offer, and I know it. So just look at it. You've got a viable buyer. If you're disappointed in how much the offer is, okay, let's just work with them. They can't be the money to offer that. Because I can tell you in my years of doing this, um, I've got an offer right now on the table on the house that's listed for 450. The offer came in at 400. Kind of went back to 445, and the buyer said, okay. <laughs> Do not pass judgment. You hear what I'm saying? This just happened this weekend. Do not pass judgment. You don't know what anybody will do. You just don't. You need to do that. You know the right answer. So, on the other side, then, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so when I was presenting that offer, um, when I'm talking to the other agent, they say, that they are pre approved with the local lender and it looks great on that side. She has some concerns about this roof. The offer's a little bit low. Can I say, you know, you're coming in a little bit low? I told you, right? I, you told me what it was, and I want to know. You know, have, don't be afraid of the conversation. Yeah. Get it out. You need, and the reason for that is that I'm looking for if, if that conversation happens differently for you, that you call me. And you tell me some, so let's do this. Hello. <laughs> Hello, this is Mike. How are you? I'm Mike. This is Maddie over here. Doing well. How are you? Good, Matt. How are you? How can I help you? Today? Great. Hey, I've got, I've got a um, buyer that I'm working with. She's interested in this home. And um, she has some concerns about the roof. But we have an offer for you. So she's a viable buyer. She's got a great. Uh, She's a pre-approval letter from the bank. It's local. Everything looked great there. Uh, she's very interested in this home, but we just... Okay. 
Thank you, Craig. So what did she offer, man? She's offered one hundred twenty-five. Oh my great day in the morning. Are you kidding me? This is the offer that she has put forward. Matt, you just send it back. You can't do the seller just to say no. You know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna call I'm gonna call the seller and let her know she's got an offer to reject. But there's no way she's just not interested in this house in price for 190 and asleep. You just tell her she's buying a time, go find another house. Wow, man. <laughs> If an agent is going to react that way, do you want to know? Yeah. Why do you want to know? What can you do about it if that happens? And it will happen. So I am brand new, but I just got out of the real estate school. And that is not what I was talking Wow. Yeah. <laughs> will that ever happen? Yeah, it will happen. And with you, so contact you. Yeah, so what, do you, what can you do about it? I mean, if, if that happens, I would call the agent. I keep asking for more information. I was like, well, how do you have to inspect it? Did yeah. Josh say something about that? Yeah. He said the agent bumps up, doesn't say anything. What about the agent? Just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> you kidding me? The inspection comes back. We have a list of 18 items. The agent goes, Are you kidding me? You got to know where the other agent is in this process. I want you to always, always remember that as a agent of the buyer, you have every right to present your offers to the owner personally. So if you have the impression that what's going to happen is Mike's going to get on the phone with his client and say, hey, I got an offer for you to kill. It's awful. Phil, I got an offer. That's the good news, but most of it's just bad. It's a crappy offer, $155,000. Should we just say no? <laughs> yeah, let's just say no. Okay, Matt, I just talked to Phil. He said no. Appreciate it. Good luck. Bye. You know, you don't control what the other agent's communicating with the client. If you're worried about it, you have the right to say, ooh, Mike, I can tell you're not happy about this. Um, he may be even less happy because I want to present the offer to the owner. I want to do it personally so I can make sure I can present the buyer to the owner so that they can so the owner can feel like thinking about. I mean, you guys can talk about whatever you want to talk about and have time for What time do you need? Well, in old days, <laughs> we didn't have fax machines, we didn't have cell phones. And we presented all of our offers next to the show. We met you know, on the phone, we presented the offers, we made sure there were no questions, and we got to the information on the phone. And that's how it's very personal. It's one of the other relationships we have forever. And we still have the right to say, we're dying to say so. So, my point here is that you, that's, so that's verbal body language. Wow, that's loud body. So when you've got an offer that is not a great offer, I mean, you think to yourself, hey, this may not be really so great. Our tendency is to just kind of slide it across the top of the table. Here, give this a look. I'll see you later. Call me if you have any questions kind of thing. Not having any confrontation. When face to face sees all that stuff, it's the odds of me having that reaction to Matt. If he was standing across the desk from me, introducing me, hi Matt. Like I do in real estate, have an offer. I'm sure the owner would like to have something different for this. Um, it's, it's, it's just a bad man who wants an offer. This is a good offer. Appreciate it. And I'd probably say, well, oh, Matt, nice to meet you. I'll talk to you about that. What are the odds of me exploding? And that face to face. I'm going to tell you that that offer that you may not go over so good. Maybe you negate that a little bit by making it more personal. It takes more time. If you can save time, I think. How would you do that if you had understood that the other agent is a very reactive agent to arrange to meet with him and then explain? Offer face to face. But you can't. Sure. And 
doing this type of thing. Now, also, remember body language is also physical, right? Now, um, I've got the offer to match the seller. And now I've already seen that. But I know Matt's reacting to this offer. Is it going to be great? And I also know that Matt is kind of a, kind of spins pretty quick. So I want to keep it under control. <coughs> so I, I, I can really see that. And I'm watching body language. I'm watching what he's doing. His eyes are rolling back in his eyes. Is he turning purple? Is he coming out of his ears? Or do you, you know, the other reaction is you're getting an offer and somebody's like this. Said the amount of the offer, the offer is 155 for the reckless. What did they just do? They closed off. They said no. They just closed the door. Didn't they? What we have to do is get them to open up their arms. So the minute they do that, then I'm old enough to say it's obvious. So I can see you're not happy with that. I wish you could want to be. Let's talk about what we can do with that. Okay? Yes. What we want to do is engage in that. Let's do it for the rest of So a really good lender. Time frames really work for what you need. Obviously, the dollar amount is good. You still have the rest of the offer. Two things, the earnest money is solid, the lender is solid, the timing is solid. Everything about it is good at this stage of the offer price. That's the only thing we have to negotiate for these two things. Water right now. But I think the dress was disappointing. But what did I also do? Build it back up by saying what? Mm -hmm. All positives. Yeah, so where the positives are not solid down the chain. So, look at this. You have to understand we're all conditioned. So if you go out and you buy a new car, how many new cars do you get in the car? How many parts are in the car? Lots. A million? I think there's a million parts in the car these days by the time you get all the washers, screws, and exposed, wires. Attachments, all this stuff, probably a million parts, right? Let me ask you do you know this the 999,996 parts that work right? Hmm. Or do you notice the four that don't? Okay. We are conditioned to notice this stuff, not this stuff. So we have to spend time doing the outcome of this stuff. Okay. Very clear negotiation. Very clear thing. Sorry, not a man. I just had a little bit to go. Um, so again, it's really important that inside, if you're not happy about something, do your best to still or try to stay out of the um, way. Some non verbal, some identifying, some counter tactics. Um, so Positioning is moving the parties closer together. So, what have you guys been listening to? Do? This here, these past couple minutes. What have I been doing? Staying calm and loose and relaxed in the conversation. Right. What else am I doing? Mm -hmm. Setting it up. Which means what? there. I'm, I'm positioning, right? So what I'm trying to do is posture it. How many, how many offers when they're written are acceptable the moment they come in? So they have, all offers have to be positioned. That's the next phase. Got it. It's presented. Now you have to get positioned. How do we, so we've got what we got. Now, how do we position? So, in our scenario, we'll pass. So, Matt, buyer's pretty worried about the roof. Huh? Well, I don't blame him. So, that's really factoring in what she's going to pay. So, that if we can show her the house, it's worth a whole lot more than what we have listed for. We can help. help. Can you help? Help. So you get some information. So, um, 
So acknowledging common ground. Because it's more important to you seller that price be what they want or that the conditions like the paintings in here are much better, higher, much more likely to get a deal with clothes or they can really come to negotiate with somebody who's in a really good position versus somebody who wants to really less. So you never know when the artist was in the field. Negotiations to buy my And so applying logic is usually a place that we that we go to and we use all the time. Most owners are more emotional because it's a real estate transaction. So if somebody who's owned their house for 10 years is a house reflection. Mm -hmm. Personal. Why does a buyer offer a property? Yes. That's true. Is it emotional? Mm -hmm. So it's when you are emotional through the logic. Sometimes it just doesn't count. Okay. Really important. So, um, so how do you handle it when in that discussion, if you have with any client, whether it's your client or the other end? How do you handle it when they go to the I would say just acknowledging that, you know, I, I understand how you see that that way. You're, you want to validate their perspective, which can oftentimes just refuse their escalated feelings. So, in almost any question I ask you guys, this is, that is the answer. Acknowledge it. All those people say, you know, whenever you acknowledge, that means theoretically it's permissible, right? Um, but you have to ask questions. So when somebody goes defensive, are you going to assume why? Or are you going to ask them? Why? Tell them why it shouldn't be. It's really, it's it is the hardest thing, by the way, to do that because everything in you wants to hear from the buyers if you want to say, right? right? So everything in you wants to get the advice, but what you should be doing is asking the questions to make sure you understand. We're going to try to see the person understand. So that's really what we need to do. Make sure that you're understanding. In your heart, you may not be able to them. So also when you do that, you're also helping you what they do. And it also helps you adjust as well. Should all offers go together? What happens when you want to deal more than they do? First, we say this. Let me ask you a question. What has happened when you want to deal more than they do? Your client. They end up resenting you and feeling like you're not representing their best interests. It's definitely a concept, right? But what's happened? <laughs> what has happened is positive. That's the reality. You want to deal more than they do because. I'll stay for the new five days. So you're trying to force something together that shouldn't be said. So make sure that we'll make sure that you stay in it, okay? Um, by the way, this deal that I just mentioned to you, the 14, they offered 400 and the 425. Um, these folks that offer, on the house, we buy it. Had offered on this property back in April for the system. Okay. It was back when it didn't work out. Yet intentionally made it easy to try to get them to be able to come back. 
So you never know when somebody will come back with something that's going to be effective. Always make sure you keep working. Not when you do it yet. Very wish to try it very, very best. You know, if they get out there looking again, and some of them will find it better, um, you still, you still got to do it. Yeah. Usually, it's Leaving the work from that out, so to speak. So, how do you help people find find your leads? So, somebody reads the scenario, somebody else the diary, the phone, and somebody else the listing. That's when you read, you read the scenario. Justin, you there? Justin? Justin? You there? Sorry. Hello. Justin. So, read the scenario for us. I don't have that paper here. And I can't seem to locate anything right now. My my wife has been sick for a couple of days and I haven't been able to do much. But. Are making an offer of three hundred and forty thousand for a house that can be pre-approved. The buyers would like to close in the shortest time possible since they are moving into an out-of-state and new FM area. Since they were leaving their appliances in the current home, the buyers would also leave all of the appliances in the Okay. So what do we do? Your sellers have raised their family in the house that you're selling and have made friends and, friends and family in the area. Since their children are now family, they no longer need to be in a space that current home provides to purchase their home for. They would like to give all their appliances to their daughter who has just gone through a divorce. They will not be moving until they sell their parents. And although they would like to get to Florida as soon as possible, they are ready to stand their ground regarding the price. <sighs> okay. What do we keep components here? Heartstrings. It's personal, right? It's emotional. They're attached. Okay. What else? Interesting. Ooh, hey, they think their house is worth three hundred and fifty. What else? And they have uh, what they consider a worthy purpose for the appliances, so they're attached to. They're emotionally attached to what is going to happen with them. They're helping their daughter. Okay. So, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? 
So we should we move forward and we're going to assume. <laughs> assuming means you didn't so, ask enough. So does the buyer's agent know what the risk is? No. So this is let, let's go under the pretense that there's been a conversation between the agents. How would that conversation be? Um, Again, just for a new guy, the buyer agent calls and says, hey, I noticed that there's been multiple offers. We have accepted them. Would, would the, the buyer agent know that? I did buy it. Yeah, I don't know. How does that agent know? They would go to the city. Are there any offers on the home? What kind of activity do you have? There aren't any offers on the home. What kind of activity do you have? We could have it. The truth is, I just think it probably should have never said that we've got any offers. So that'd be very disarming to have that discussion. Um, so, as a listing agent, what would the, if that phone call happen? So, it's kind of a role play through this a little bit. So, what would, what would the discussion be then? So, um, So who here did a bid buyer's agent and call them? That's the question. I'm the master of plan this is somebody else. Oh, I'm the buyer's agent. Buyer. Okay, I've got a buyer um, ready and willing to make an offer. It's under asking. He wants to call the appliances. Um, what are your sellers? How are they? How do we feel about the appliances? Have we had any offers? Um, so, so I'll start at the end. Yeah, we've had some offers. Nothing we've ever together. You know, the owners, they've been here for a long time, raised the family here. They're pretty happy. There's a lot of nice improvements to it. Um, hopefully, the buyers can figure out something else for appliances since the, uh, the owners have actually been giving them to their daughter. So they've already got those kids, so they're really not there yet. Um, I don't I don't think we've got them in the listing as being there, but they're really not. So um try to get this in there. So you know, other than that, you know negotiations never finish and never begin. Or it's having an offer. Okay, now we're going to do the appliances in this area. Whereas most people do, so when you reduce your price, your sales price, because you know you're not getting the appliances. So, at what point in time do you start acting like you're negotiating like you're the owner versus the owner or the buyer actually doing it? So, you know what? This is a very, this is a very, very important point. Um, so easy to move into that mode, right? Where you're going to you're you're the negotiate, you're the negotiate, not the negotiate more, you're the negotiate. You know, in, in pro sports, the agents have a lot of power though. You hear these athletes saying, I have no idea, I'm waiting to hear from the agent to find out what he decided to do. Now if that agent and that athlete had high of discussion, right? They've got their plan down and that that pro athlete is not saying I have no idea what my agent's doing. And that athlete saying I don't know what the agent has gotten worked out. So here I gave information. So in, in that communication, did I say anything about the price? He said the price was not going to be good. Did I go back and challenge him? Why not? Because you don't want to discourage, you don't want to discourage an offer. You don't want to discourage an offer. Um, do I know what the sellers will do? Do I know what the owners will do? You probably have a pretty good idea of what their response is. Do I know what they're doing? But you don't know. No, no. 
because the discussion is different now. Because when I talk with them, I know. I didn't tell her there's going to be other options. I know, and I know what those offers were. At some point in time, you know, we've got to start to listen, right? In all these different scenarios. Now, our other agent just heard something else. Like, what did you hear? Yeah. 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 You heard that? What else did you hear? And did I leave any question? No. Did I leave it as a negotiating? Did I even open up the no. door at all? Thank you. Is that important? Awesome. You watch what doors you open by what you say, and watch what doors you close by what you say. Because I could have just killed the deal. But you know what? One thing I do know about these owners is they're giving those appliances to their daughter. If their daughter starts to divorce, it's personal and it's a hardship. And there's one place I'm not going to challenge. That's one of them. That's a landing that we have to go. So I've been really clear. So now I've gone back to her and what now, what would you say to your buyers? You just carry the story out. The folks that you're working with, the buyers, what are you going to say to them? I would go back and say it's says those appliances aren't included and the reason they're not included is because I didn't need those yet. You don't need to do it yet. It's easier. You're establishing a standard in code. You should stay away. So we're, we're, we're having discussion design which I didn't do right away. So you know your thing back there is to say hey if you talk to the owners here's the situation with those appliances. And because of the situation in my opinion is it's not something I can do. So Guys, we'd like to have you out for a five minutes. And I think one thing that comes to my mind is if the buyers, they obviously want the appliances that are there to be fit to come home before, et cetera. Maybe if, and I don't know their reasoning for all of what's in there aside from what they said, but they may be willing to buy some appliances that will work for the daughter. And that will fit into their own because not all not all appliances are going to fit into the same space the different spaces in different places yeah those appliances first person you start to put them in play mm -hmm. probably like not the whole time okay. honestly i'm just giving you that advice for when you get family when you get kids moving moving that course the owners want to do that at all this is a place it's a that's not a trade off. It's a bone you better you better just dig and bury where it's buried. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, you know, over here the discussion is different. Well, we don't have the cash. Well then maybe we ought to just consider having an offer and creating an allowance for those clients. Whatever you want to pay, you pay back to any bank or the house and they can create a you know four thousand dollars. Hold off and pay the offer until you can see the actual sale of the offer. If you can figure out what it take you to replace those appliances. Because they have to have a solution for that. We, we can know that that's not that. It's theoretical. Now, if family takes it out of there, so now the offer comes back. She calls me back and says, Mike, buyers just changed the offer. 
Um, they felt like the house was sort of too horny with, with the biases and shit. But since the bias is not there, you know, that's what that they want to pay for it. They don't have money. So they've been down the store, they went down to Lowe's, and they found, you know, that they believe to be the equivalent of biases. It's worth possibly $1,000. So they're offering, it's still offering for forty. There's a four thousand dollar allowance for the price. Cost of your place for the property. I want to see them over the brochures and information. See, they're not. I would go off and get drink and drink stuff and the kind of stuff that this person there. They can send it over with the offer. Now, what if mom and dad realize that it's worth possibly four thousand dollars? Now it's been quantified with the quantity. They take it out of play. They may, they may say, you know what? We called our daughter and said it's out. Oh, we did. Okay. Well, now this will be wrong to do. I had nothing to do with getting them off. I'm not the bad guys on the other side. Puts them in a position to be able to say, no, it's not so putting them off. But if they want to reconsider, they will. Okay. So, anyway. Always uh, be creative in what you're doing. Find the time to find. That's, that's the point. If you've got an obstacle, you have to find a way past it, or if they have to go find another house. Don't force it to get to point. Because they say, well, there's no way that you want this house to be up in the understand you have to pay for allowance in order to do that. That's not what you're going to try to do. Be perfectly willing to do it. What's the first step in negotiations? Fair. So let's keep on. And, and do we have counter offers? First deal that was always put together? You almost expect that this point is hard. So your client has found the house they love, and it's in the neighborhood they want. It's at the top of the price rate and does need some work updating the kitchen to match the bathroom. The client makes an offer on the property and the seller agent says, I must warn you that we have gotten several offers and your offer is pretty low. So the sellers need to move within 45 days due to a job transfer. You feel that you have priced the house competitively you're aware the house needs updating, but the sellers don't see the need because the house was just fine. <laughs> <laughs> there have been multiple offers. The other offers are still standing, but the timing may not work for the seller. And the latest offer is lower than the asking price. You have let the buyer's agent know, I must warn you that we've got the sale offers and the offer is pretty low. Sounds weird. That's kind of weird. Yeah. There's a question more with me. Well, why, what about the other offers? Why have you not accepted the other offers? What is it that you're still looking for? I mean, I know it's probably a better way to ask that question, but that's what I would be looking for. So why haven't the other offers worked out? Having the sellers in the form of the one term. That's how the cat is not going to get um, So, what should happen? The buyer's agent, what should happen? We just hung up in this phone call. We just found out there's multiple offers. And I just found them that they're both not in, they're all in play, and that their offer is pretty low. Yeah, the conversation with the client is that this is the house you want, how much do you want to make? And tell me this is the other offers in the plan, and ours is pretty low. How do you want to see it? Is there a question that wasn't asked here, by the way? So now you're telling me there's multiple offers. Um, 
you have offers on the table. So who is am I the buyer's agent? Position being it's not the buyer's agent. So Matt, um, you say you have other offers on the table. How many? Yeah, how many? I want to know how many. Three. There's three. <laughs> okay. I was just trying to know. <laughs> 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 three offers. We're just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Matt, if you would give me the offer. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, any from any of the team members? Any of the offers for more than the offer that we have? Yes. How many of them? All of them. All of them are for one by offer. Okay, great. I'll let the buyers know. Thank you. So now I pick up the phone and do what? Who do I call? Your clients. The buyers. The buyers. What do I tell the buyers? It's not hard now. Brittany, what do I tell the buyers? That they came in low. Tell me more than that. So, what's wrong with just telling them about the full conversation? Hey, I called the other, I called Matt, the other agent. I mean, there are multiple offers on the house. I asked him how many. He told me there were three. I asked him if he'd written many of them. He said no. I asked him if any of his team members wrote, wrote that. He said no. By the way, another question I would ask is if I the offers continue. I'm selling another property that's price of money from the bank. Um, and then I, I asked him how many of the offers were for, were for more than your offer. And he said all three were for more. So I wanted to let you know and call you and see what you want to do. And your choices are what are the choices? Change your offer. You can leave it stand, or you could just say, Plan B. We're going to offer on House B. I'm not going to wait around here for this because there's another house I really like. And can you find out if it has offers on it? It's another option too. They, they may have. What if you didn't tell them anything about any of this discussion, and House B <coughs> sold by you a horsing around with House A? Does that ever happen? Feel really bad with this, right? Okay. Have open dialogue. You know that that builds so much trust in the process. If you have open dialogue and tell people everything, don't filter. Okay. It doesn't mean we have to be as candid as we may appear to be. It does mean we don't filter. Right? Oh, So, three things that I should do. Yes, we just listen to the conversation themselves. So let's just say that Brittany's buyer wrote that offer, let their offer stand right where it was. Now there's four offers on the table. All four offers are. Lower than this. I've had a conversation with you on this. We talked about that. We talked about the value of money. We talked about the value of share. We talked about the value of share. We talked about the value of share. By the way, the pre negotiation, when you're preparing for negotiations, this discussion with the owner about searching for the market, everyone will disappear from the market. Everyone will look for the market. That negotiation should happen in the market. That negotiation just starts. Might you stop receiving offers? It's late because if it takes a month, the owner spent a month taking their house into foreclosure and twisted for them because you've never told them that they have time. So now you're trying to dislodge all the time before you listed the property plus the time you had it, and now you're trying to dislodge that belief in a short period of time. And it's harder to do. And you have time. You have, you have to process enough time to go through. 
So um, for the buyer, um, what's a key component in here for the buyer? That you need to know and understand. In the first sentence. They found the house they loved and it's in the neighborhood they want. Why do you want that neighborhood? Well, it has, it's in Sunnyside School and it's the school that I want my kids to. Does that have value to you compared to a house in Bethlehem? Well, Why would you buy a house that's in it? Are you sure? Really? Why? Have you done that job? No, I really would. Sunnyside is a good one. Okay, so are you willing to pay for that? There's a lot of folks in the school. Start trying to decide who, how much is this location worth? You know what the first three rules of real estate are? Location and investment. Yeah. Is location worth money? Yes. Look, and if you have a house on 17th Street versus a house on 20th Street, and have the same house in both locations, which one's worth more? The one that's not on 17th. The one that's not on 17th. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because nobody wants to live in my race for it. Why? Because it's location, crazy. right? Yeah. Location. So location has value. And so we need to go through that and remind people. Sometimes, remember what we said in the beginning, we take people back to their why. Why are you offering on this location? Well, that will come up and all the other stuff. From a math standpoint, guys, how much does it cost in house payment? How much will someone's house payment go up if they go up $10,000 in per piece? It's not a meaningful conversation. Someone's going to battle. I know they want to the school they want to go. Forty-eight dollars a month stopping them from sending their children to school they want to go. Right. So, um, so the first step in negotiation is when do we start preparing? Mm -hmm. Very, 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 mm -hmm. very, very, very beginning. You have to be more than just a nice person or something. You believe that you got to do some stuff. Ah. Right. So we prepare. Then what do we do? We present. And then position. Now positioning usually isn't a one-time thing. Positioning happens, especially if you have, in both cases, with the sellers and with buyers. Positioning is ongoing. It's not only when you have offers in place, right? The positioning is about educating, educating people about the market and their price range. What's selling, what's buying, what are the risk sell ratios, what's available in the areas they want, if there's specific schools. They don't say if I can more than two or three houses in that area available to you, it's all those things. Um, so what? What about the negotiation process causes you the most confusion or the most concern? You know what a purchase agreement Have you read a purchase agreement? All the way through? From start to finish? Have you built one out? 
So, in, the, in terms of preparing for negotiation, is earnest money important? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can tell it's not earnest money. Shows a level of commitment and interest. Okay. So if someone is wanting to write an offer on a thousand property, ten thousand dollar property, and they put a five hundred dollar earnest money, it just doesn't feel like you're that interested in the process. So it shows that earnest. That's really classy lady. Cheesy engagement name. Can you make? Off. First time you talked about earnest money is when you write an offer. It's pretty bad. Um, when, when is an earnest money automatically forfeit? Just checking your head. It's not. Say I'm looking at a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house. I put together a deal on a two hundred fifty thousand house. It's together. I'm a buyer, and we've done the inspection, we've done the appraisal, and there's a house two doors down that came on the market. And I stood up and looked at it. It's an export. It's high level, way more than the house that I offered. And I want to bail. I'm going to pull. I'm not going to buy that with the house I'm out. My earnings money about that is okay. If it's not worth it, so it's not a good deal. It's an important thing, by the way. It's an important thing. Should I? What does it take to get that earnest money deposited? A purchase and offer a contract and accept. So we have to have a successful negotiation. I want to go back to sports. Have you ever heard the athlete say, or anything on the news saying, so and so, big rock star, sports star, is trying to negotiate their way out of their contract? Mm -hmm. Realize we've got contracts, right? Mm -hmm. So, guys, be sure to read in our first team and go back and read your instructions. It says, this is a negotiation. It is. It is another area where we have negotiation. As when, a, when, a, when an offer terminates, if you're terminating without cause, in other words, the inspection is fine, you've got everything's fine, you're just not going to do what you're going to do. What is it going to go on in the next 14 years? It's not going to happen. It takes an agreement between the two, and it's money into the trust account. It requires an agreement with the parties to get out. In the absence of the agreement to get it out, it is, and it goes to court. So it's a negotiated settlement. So you have to keep in mind what that means. What if, when that happened, that I decided in two days before closing, you blew, you're out. And you signed a one year lease on the house, right? And took it over. So you're on the hook for $1,500 a month. And now suddenly, the house you were selling, it also has payments of fifteen hundred dollars per month. And it's going back on the market. Are you impressed by my three thousand dollars earnest money? Why not? Can you go very far? Do you have any rights to get more from me than just earnest money? Mm -hmm. This is a legal question, right? Be careful practicing, you know where we start and the law begins. Um, if 
the reason earnest money is an automatic report then is to make sure that either party has time to have them check out the earnest money. So it's a contract law. So the damaged party has the right to recover damages from from faults of the party. So people have to understand so the point of the negotiation is that earnest money is a limit of liability. So part of the earnest money discussion, the buyer will say, I just want to do a thousand dollars earnest money because if I don't do this, I don't want to be at risk. I don't want to have too much risk. You say, okay. Sometimes you end up with a quarter thousand dollars of money if it's a legitimate default. So the seller's remedies are to treat a seller or somebody can go to court. So the seller's remedies is to accumulate the damages. How many months did it take to sell? How much were my payments? How much were utilities? How much were the maintenance costs? Did I end up selling the house for five thousand dollars less than what the contract was with you? Those are damages to accumulate the damages. So be sure you read the earnest money clause of the contract. Sure, you slow down and get contact with them. And when you have questions on it, your wife is upstairs, she says, What do you do? Contact. So be sure you can check in. One of your biggest aha was the negotiation stuff. I like the idea of saying the curiosity. It allows you to emotionally be less vested and more of like, okay, I can see you're upset, but tell me, tell me why. Talk to me. Come in. Ask questions. Exactly. Sure to ask questions. That builds trust. So stay away from judgment. Find people who are making decisions you make. Sure. <clears throat> what else? Then it shows that when you don't know what to do, you follow the rules of the person. When you aren't sure what to do, if you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. Always remember what are the reasons for the decision? You're surrounded by a lot of expertise in this point. Great job, but it's, it happened just kind of recently, so yeah, that's what it is.